I want to share with you from Matthew's Gospel one of the most important passages in my life. Turn with me in your Bibles if you have it. Some of you I know have your Bible right there on your telephone to Matthew chapter 9, verse 35. Jesus went through all the towns and villages, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom, and healing every disease and sickness. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless, like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, The harvest is truly plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send forth workers into his harvest field. I've had the privilege of being in about 100 nations of the world. And I wear this global jacket uh, to just uh, remind people that we should be praying for the nations. And some of you have that brilliant book, Operation World, that presents prayer requests on all the nations of the world. It's now a shorter edition called Pray for the World. And I surely hope you have a copy. This verse and this passage is often what I use when I first go to a church and I just share my testimony. Because I'm here because of a woman who took God's word seriously. She believed what it said and so she prayed actually for the high school across from her home that the Lord would send workers from her high school. I love this passage because it starts with a focus on Jesus. And we see Jesus was a person of action. I've just been restudying the book of Mark and realize Mark is all action. There's not nearly the amount of teaching as Luke and Matthew. It's all action. And if you're not in the action, if you're not sharing your faith, if you're not helping people, do, doing good Samaritan ministry, Luke chapter 10, then something is seriously wrong in your life. One of my greatest fears as I minister and go to so many conferences and so many meetings, is that for some of the people, it's just a head trip. It somehow never got down into their feet and into their life in a practical way, affecting how they use their time. The Bible says, redeem the time because the days are evil. And I just thank the Lord. I wasn't a Christian when this lady prayed for me. My grandfather from the Netherlands, I'm headed there this weekend, he, he was an atheist, and he and my dad moved to the New York City area looking for the good life. My grandfather never found it, by the way. My other grandfather, he was Scottish, Irish, and English. Wow, combination, I mean, that must be toxic. He was an alcoholic, a drunk. My grandmother divorced him. So I didn't have the kind of Christian legacy that probably some of you have, probably have. Of the 200,000 people who have served with OM, probably half have come from Christian families. And we could see often that legacy in their own lives. I could give you a hundred stories of people from Christian families, even two or three generations, and how God has used them. Isn't it beautiful that no matter what our background, what our struggles and difficulties, God can use us. So we see the Lord Jesus going out into the action. And I hope you, as a believer, are involved in the action. Sometimes in the streets, sometimes door to door. Sometimes visiting prisons, sometimes visiting hospitals. There's so much to do. There's so many, whatever country you're living in, there's so many that haven't even heard the gospel for the first time. But the passage I especially want to look at is where it says the harvest is plenteous. The workers are few. To go back to my story, she not only prayed that I become a Christian, she prayed that I would become a missionary. Imagine, she didn't even discuss this with me. I had other plans for my life, and I was a very happy person. I just especially love to dance. I love sports, lots of different girlfriends. I just had a huge ego. I was about to be elected president of the whole student government. I was fine until this, this interfering woman came into my life. I shouldn't give you this advice, but if you want to live your own selfish life, avoid praying women. Yeah, 
Uh, don't sit next to them in church and make sure they don't get your name. Anyway, she got my name and then my address and sent me a gospel of John through the post. God used his word. At that same time, pornography in a small way began to make inroads into my life and really was causing a lot of struggle. And then Billy Graham, God's servant. This was just a one-night stand, March 3rd, 1955, sponsored by a converted band leader named Jack Wurston. And somehow, because of a proactive business person, I went to that meeting and I heard the gospel. And Billy Graham, when he gave that invitation to believe on Jesus, he called people to come forward. In the mercy of the Lord, I went forward and I trusted Jesus as my Savior and Lord. Of course, I didn't understand it. And when you profess Jesus, and if you haven't done that yet, I hope you soon will, it doesn't mean you will understand it all. It doesn't mean you won't continue to have doubts. I've battled various doubts all my life. A great Scottish theologian helped me when he said, great faith is not in the absence of doubt. It's often as we're walking through them. He not only saved me that night and put his Holy Spirit in me, but looking back, and there's now a film about this, I realized he sent me that night because I immediately started to share my faith in my high school. I even got the principal, the headmaster, to give me permission to distribute Gospels of John and about a thousand students promised to read the Gospel. Later on during Christmas break, I got back to the school and hundreds came to hear my testimony including my own father who was really wondering what happened to his son. I'll never forget that night as about 125 of my fellow students and friends stood up to profess faith in Jesus. I'm sure they weren't all necessarily born again or truly converted that night. That's a mystery I had to learn a lot more about in the future. But I know some of them were, including my own dad who lived for Jesus until he was 94 years of age. I want to encourage you to pray to the Lord of the harvest that he'll send forth workers into the harvest field. It says here the workers are few. Of course, that's not true now, 2,000 years later. There are many, many countries where there are thousands of workers. But here's something I'd like you to remember and take into your prayer ministry that there are about 40 nations with very little work. There are about 40 nations that would have less than, less than 1% of the witness where I live. I live in London, a great city of 10 million. We have a million Muslims. So, of course, London is a mission field. So what are we going to say about 40 other nations where there's very few ambassadors of the Lord Jesus or whatever you want to call them? Praise God in answer to prayer. In every one of those countries, there begins to be some rays of light. We're hearing of small Bible studies, even in very closed countries. We're hearing of Afghans coming to Jesus. We're hearing of Saudis who are worshiping Jesus privately in their own home. We're hearing of a few believers now there in Tibet. I lived in Nepal for a while. And in those days in Nepal, there were only a few thousand believers. I was in Nepal actually celebrating my 60th spiritual birthday. It's, it's shown on that film of my life story. And now there are hundreds of thousands of believers, thousands of churches in Nepal. How we'd love to see that north there in Tibet. But so far, that's not happened. Prayer is one of the most exciting aspects of our Christian life. I hope you're involved in some good prayer meetings. I think of there in the book of Acts. Peter was in prison. It looked really grim. But prayer was being made without ceasing. Soon he was out of prison. We read in a few verses later, he went to the house where Mary, where many were gathered together praying. There's no excuse for Christians not being involved in at least some kind of prayer meeting. The Bible doesn't teach just personal prayer, which many of us, of course, find a lot easier, but it teaches corporate prayer. I feel many verses are sort of just thrown out the window 
as we just have cafeteria Bible study and, and take the verses that we like. Pray the Lord of the harvest. He'll send workers into Libya, into Tunisia, into Morocco. He'll send workers into Yemen, into Turkmenistan, Uzbekistan. He'll send workers into these more unreached places of the world. Being involved in global missions is one of the most exciting, challenging, stretching adventures you could ever get involved in. But guess what? You don't have to go overseas because God in his providence is bringing these people to our doorsteps. Let's face it, as we look back at the last hundred years, we have failed, especially to reach the Muslim world. And so God in his providence is bringing the Muslims to us. How sad it is that some Christians have nothing but fear and a wrong attitude concerning this great mass movement of people. Whereas those who love Jesus and really follow the teachings of Jesus embrace this as an opportunity to share. And if you read books like Wind in the House of Islam, you realize God is working among Muslims more than ever before in history. How I thank the Lord as I look back at these 60 years of following him for that very ordinary woman in her own home who prayed for me and sent me a Gospel of John. Wherever you are, God wants to use you. Through this experience we've had together today, God wants to do a new thing in your life, and I'd love to hear about it. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for how you use this amazing woman to birth the entire global ministry of Operation Mobilization that has given your word to a billion people, a thousand million across the world, that is giving a tra has given a training experience to over 200,000 people. Lord, surely this is a challenge for all of us to be more involved in prayer, more involved in the action. Grant us the grace to do this, for we ask in Jesus' name, amen.